barbarians. My favorite D&D class. But civilizations in the East and West hate them. In this video, I will use 10 quotes to illustrate the difference between how barbarians in the West and East Asia were perceived throughout history. By the way, this video is a collab with Francesca Tacchi, an Italian writer with a passion for history. If you want to know an actual Italian's perspective on Italian history, then be sure to follow Francesca on Twitter. Link in the description. Once defeated, Greece conquered its savage captor. The original term, barbaros, was used by the Greeks to designate everyone who didn't speak Greek, in a disparaging way, such as the Scythians, but it also included the Persians and Romans. In fact, it is an onomatopoeic word meant to imitate the stuttering and, according to Greek historian Herodotus, beastly sound of someone who speaks a foreign language. For some time, the Romans called themselves Barbary as well, because they didn't speak Greek. But with the advent of the Roman Republic, the term changed meaning and became more connected to the cultural and ethnic elements we associate with the word today. So as you can see, there is a semantic evolution of the word. Meanwhile, in East Asia, China assumes the role of the Greeks and established the distinction between the civilized, them, and uncivilized, everyone else. However, there isn't a single word for barbarian in Chinese. In ancient documents such as Siji, they generalize different cultures in relation to the Chinese central plain, Dongyi, Nanman, Xirong, Beidi, or Eastern Yi, Southern Man, Western Rong, and Northern Di. Just like how the Greeks used the word Scythian to generalize all the different nomadic pastoral culture. China used these words to distinguish them from the Chinese Huaxia civilization. But this directional distinction isn't strictly defined, and different words were used for different foreign cultures throughout time, such as Hu, and the meaning changes according to the dynasty and contemporary politics. Just to make it easier to follow, I will go through the evolution of the idea of barbarians in the West first before going to East Asia. Don't eat at Lucio Istasidius' table. He is like a barbarian to me. This line was discovered among Pompey's graffiti. Being a barbarian became a synonym for being uncivilized, not of being not Roman. The Romans actually had a lot of respect for other Mediterranean civilizations, such as Carthage, even though they had other sets of prejudices against them. It is the barbaric Europe that they frowned upon, as a land of savage tribes. Romans had a lot of stereotype against barbarians such as the Huns, Franks, Vandals, Saxons, and Goths. They are considered basically feral, extremely unruly, and bloodthirsty in battle. Plus the whole package of barbarians making human sacrifices and they don't treat their women well. They care only about fighting and don't produce art as good as ours. However, the Romans also kind of admired the barbarians. Among the barbaric population, the most valiant are the Belgians, who live further from civilization and its sophistication that softens the spirit. Caesar himself considered the barbarians to be uncivilized and inferior in skills to the Romans. But at the same time, he respected the strength they had that came specifically from being uncivilized. The Romans had a complicated relationship with all this civilization thing. He also disbanded a cohort of Germans, whom the previous Caesars had made their bodyguard and found absolutely faithful in many emergencies and sent them back to their native country without any rewards. Romans admired the barbarians' strength and valor to the point that they began employing them as elite troops and even as personal guards for the emperor. Here, Svetonius is using the fact Emperor Galba dismissed the German cohort without even paying them as proof of his short-sightedness and unsuitability to rule. One such that braggart Robert notorious for his power lust, born in Normandy but cursed and nourished by manifold evil. Father and son you might liken to caterpillar and locusts. 
for what was left by Robert, his son fed on and devoured. After the Western Roman Empire fell, the eastern half, which is commonly known as the Byzantine Empire, resorted to the old ways of disparaging the European population. To Eastern Roman Empress Anna Comnena and other Byzantines, the European barbarians were not worthy of respect, not even when their tribes had turned into kingdoms. The fact that Constantinople was sacked by the Crusaders during the Fourth Crusade perhaps vindicated her opinion. In East Asia, the relationship between the civilized and the barbarians also evolved through time, and the template was first set by China. This is an excerpt of the description of the Xiongnu in Sima Qian's Si Ji, records of the Grand Historian, written during the Han Dynasty. It is their custom to herd their flock in time of peace and make their living by hunting. But in period of crisis, they take up arms and go off on plundering and marauding expeditions. This seems to be their inborn nature. The Chinese's description of other cultures was very predictable. Their descriptions of people from other territories, such as Bactria and India, were generally neutral. But if they have conflict with a the group, then you can usually find quite a few snipes on their description. The nomadic Xiongnu Empire was really powerful back then and extorted the Han Dynasty to pay them exorbitant amount of tribute as part of the Heqing Marriage Alliance. So it is easy to understand why they would be described negatively. But we should also consider the motives of the writer. The historian Sima Qian lived during the rule of Han Wu Di, the powerful Han Dynasty emperor who waged war against the Xiongnu. Sima Qian was actually on the anti-war side, so in his record, there is also a claim that the Xiongnu was descended from a royalty from the mythical Xia dynasty, which ended over a thousand years before his time. So this claim may not be very reliable. There is a few possibility why he would make such claim. One, it might be because he wanted to claim that the Xiongnus were distant relatives of the Huaxia culture, and fighting them is bad. Or it could be to reduce the embarrassment of being forced into an inferior position by the Hu people. Or perhaps it's both. But throughout Chinese history, there were always opposing forces that rejects and accepts the foreign. In the book, Huainan Zi, commissioned by the Han Dynasty prince Huainan, it said, King Gou Jian of Yue cut his hair and tattooed his body. He did not have leather caps or jade belt ornaments. He lacked the posture of bowing and bending. Even so, he defeated Fu Cai at Five Lakes. Facing south, he was a hegemon of the world. This passage basically claims that, despite belonging to a different culture, the legendary King Gou Jian was considered a hero by the Huaxia civilization. This love-hate relationship fluctuates through dynasties. In the golden age of the Tang dynasty, when China was powerful and well-known for its cosmopolitan culture, Emperor Tang Taizong proclaimed that he would rule the Turkic people and the Han Chinese equally. He claimed both the title Son of Heaven and the Han of Heaven. But during the Song dynasty, when China faced the constant threat from the north, from the Kitan, Liao dynasty, and the Jurchen, Jing dynasty, they became more xenophobic. And this relationship between the civilized and not civilized was imported to Japan, Korea, and Vietnam as template. In Japan, the Japanese history book Nihon Shoki had this to say about the Yemishi. Among the eastern savages, the Yemishi are the most powerful. Their men and women live together promiscuously. There is no distinction of father and child. Ever since antiquity, they had not been steeped in the kingly civilizing influences. The Emishi lived in northeastern Japan, and if you look at the kanji, or Chinese characters for Emishi, it contains the kanji for Yi, which is usually translated as Eastern Barbarian. Europeans were called Nanbanjin, the same Chinese word for Nanman, which is often translated into English as Southern Barbarians. This is because when the Japanese first met the Portuguese, they were grouped together with other merchants from Southeast Asia who would have sailed up to Japan from the south. In Korea, 
when the Choson dynasty had very close relationship with the Ming dynasty China, they considered themselves to be the Little China. So Zhonghua, with the establishment of the Qing dynasty, when China was conquered by the Manchu people, Korea, Japan and Vietnam all thought that China was over. It was overrun by the barbarians and now they have become the successor of the Zhonghua civilization. Korean Confucian literati Kim Ian said that Nowadays, the barbarians had taken over China. Chinese people served their king as king and followed their rituals. Who but us should be regarded as the China in this world for the time being? Of course, the Qing dynasty would disagree with that. Emperor Yongzhen argued that the Yi can also become the Hua Chinese and distributed propaganda tracts to undermine the Hua Yi distinction and discourage rebellions. During the Nguyen dynasty, Vietnam pretty much did the same thing and claimed to be the new China and Vietnamese were the real Han people. They set up their own tributary system resembling the Chinese's towards other Southeast Asian countries. Emperor Minh Mang even actively attempted to assimilate other cultures within the expanding Vietnamese empire. We must hope that their barbarian habits will be subconsciously dissipated and that they will become more infected by Han, in this case, Vietnamese culture. So here we can see the evolution of the concept of barbarian in the West and East Asia. In the West, originally, barbarian means anyone who didn't speak Greek. Then, the so-called barbarian Romans changed the definition to cultures that were savage and brutish. And this is pretty much the definition for the word barbarian that we have today. In East Asia, there is no exact translation of the word barbarian. But there were quite a few commonly used words for non-Hua civilizations. These words are usually roughly translated as barbarian in English. But they really have more specific meaning, and it kinda changes through time. During the Han Dynasty and earlier, Hu was used for northern nomadic pastoralists. But during the Tang Dynasty, in the lead up to the Anlu Sun's rebellion, the definition narrowed to Sogdians. In general, the concept is pretty similar to the Greeks's, but it later evolved into the idea that anyone can work towards becoming civilized. But it also devolved into everyone accusing everyone else to be barbarians. But really, despite all the differences, there is one thing in common with the evolution of the word barbarian in the East and West. The semantics of the word changes according to the politics of the day, and it is used to demean their enemies. Alright, that's it for the episode. Once again, I would like to thank Francesca Taki for helping me with the research. Remember to follow Francesca on Twitter for more Italian history content. And if you want more cool history videos like this, then remember to like, share, and subscribe. If you would like to suggest and vote on future topics, then be a pro and join us on Patreon. Until next time, stay cool, my bros.